Have you ever considered how peculiar diabetes care is? I live very close to Stanford, where I was a graduate student in the 70s, just at the beginning of when diabetes was beginning to take off. We had many wonderful students in my department who grew up in Asia, and when we had meals with them, they were heavy in rice and veggies, light in fish and chicken, and no processed food at all. I will never forget going to China in 1984 on a special work visa with my wife and eating in a huge, raucous, loud building with tables piled high in veggies and a little bit of fish. Tony asked our translator if she could have a little sugar to put on her rice, and the translator looked like a ghost had just walked over her grave, but she dutifully asked the waitress for some sugar. The waitress looked shocked, but she brought the sugar anyway, and when Tony poured it on her rice, the whole room went quiet, and the Chinese looked over and went, oh, who ever heard of sugar on rice? Fast forward 40 years and our area has become filled with Asians, as you can probably see around me at this farmer's market. When they settled down in America, their diets changed dramatically, much lower in whole plant foods, much higher in processed foods, and much higher in animal foods. And they hopped on the diabetes train along with us. And here's the peculiar thing, I think. When they get diabetes, they dramatically change their diet a second time, this time to further reduce veggies and rice, to completely eliminate processed foods, which we all know is a great thing, and to greatly increase protein and fat. The great news is it immediately stabilizes their blood sugar and they lose weight. Big wins for diabetes care. And for the rest of their lives, they will try to eat a diet that's dramatically different than the one they grew up on. But some don't do that. Instead, they shop here at the farmer's market and go back to a diet that has been traditional in Asia for millennia. That was before so much processed food invaded China, and they began to eat a lot more meat, becoming a lot more like Americans. What fascinates me is how the results of the two compare. If you go the low-carb route, it acts fast, and there's a very short period of adjustment. So popular is the low-carb route that the company Verta Health, which had raised a bunch of money before, recently raised $133 million and put their valuation at $2 billion. And their whole business model is to reverse type 2 diabetes with a low-carb diet. But have you really reversed the disease if you can never have a banana or orange again? Maybe you've just controlled the leading symptom, high blood sugar, but the underlying cause is still there. On the other hand, if you go back to a diet that has a lot of bananas and oranges in it, how in the world do you keep your blood sugar from spiking now that you're in a diabetic state? I mean, even your continuous glucose monitor is gonna tell you that's a no-go. So how would you do it and how long does that take and how do the long-term results compare to a low-carb diet? So I decided to dive deep on these questions by connecting with the Mastering Diabetes guys. Their business is to reverse diabetes via a whole plant low-fat diet. And between you and me, I think they have the tougher business proposition to sell over Verta Health. Because no bacon for you. And bacon's got to be more popular than bananas and oranges, right? And Cyrus, I know you can't joke about this, but you kind of got the hat trick of autoimmune diseases, didn't you? I know. Yeah, I scored, man. I got, I got three. For, I'm three for three at this point. <laughs> Bring it on. Three I'll for three. Whatever. And, and they all came in rapid succession kind of later when you were 22. You were a senior yeah. at Stanford. And I was basically a senior at Stanford. I was just trying to graduate. And I got, within six months, I got Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, then alopecia, and then type 1 diabetes, bam, bam, bam. And I was like, bam, bam, bam. Uh, I, I don't understand what's happening. Please, someone explain. Did anybody ever explain? Have you figured it out? Uh, no, there is no explanation for it because um, doctors don't really have a very firm grasp on what causes autoimmunity in general. So you could basically take any autoimmune condition. You could say, hey, doctor, you know, even you can even go to a, rheum uh, a rheumatologist, say, hey, what causes Hashimoto's hypothyroidism? And they'll tell you, oh, well, it's when your antibodies are blah, blah, blah. And you're like, no, no, no. What causes it? And they don't know the answer. Say, what causes MS? Don't know the answer. What causes type 1 diabetes? What causes Crohn's disease? What causes celiacs? Don't know the answer. There's a hypothesis. It's been around since 1980. You'd know a lot more than me. The bovine milk hypothesis on type yeah. 1 diabetes. Yeah, molecular mimicry. Where does that stand? Yeah, there's actually a significant amount of research on that. Um, there's this process called molecular mimicry, which basically means that when you eat protein that has a similar epitope, so basically like a fragment of the protein, that resembles, that's very close, that has a very similar amino acid sequence to protein inside of your own body. So you have your own endogenous mammalian protein, and then you have this uh, exogenous mammalian protein that you consume. And the two of them are so closely linked to each other that if that epitope has, a couple of things have to happen. Number one, the protein has to get basically partially digested inside of your immune, inside of your digestive system, and then it has to escape into circulation. And the only way that it can get into circulation is if there's basically like uh, permeability inside of your small intestine, okay? So if you have a permeable gut, 
then what will end up happening is that these protein fragments will end up escaping effectively into your blood. If you don't have a permeable gut, then the protein fragments cannot escape into your gut or they escape in very small quantities and they don't elicit a reaction because what's supposed to happen is that these protein fragments that are like 10, 15, 20 amino acids in length actually have to get cut into either one, two, or three amino acids in length. So either a single peptide, or sorry, a single amino acid, a dipeptide, or a tripeptide. And when they're in that small of a peptide chain, then the epithelial cells inside of your gut can absorb them and then process them and put them into circulation. But what ends up happening is that when you have this, you know, quote unquote, leaky gut or perforated gut, then these protein fragments end up escaping. So if they get inside of your bloodstream, then these protein fragments are now floating in your blood. Your immune system recognizes it and was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I didn't make that. That is not from me. That is not from a human. Let me go, let me go mount an immune response. So the immune response begins, but the problem is that th those protein fragments are so closely related to other protein fragments. In the case of type 1 diabetes, there's proteins that are on the outside of the, the extracellular matrix of the, of the beta cells. And so the, uh, your immune system is so good at recognizing these proteins that it actually mistakens the extracellular proteins on the beta cells for the protein fragments that came from your food. And now you have a reaction which basically is called autoimmune, and that's where you create autoantibodies against those particular protein fragments. And now you have this 24-7, uh, um, you have a 24-7 autoimmune process which then labels the, um, what do you call them? The beta cells for programmed cell death, AKA apoptosis. So it all starts with having a perforated gut or like a permeable gut. And if you can prevent that from happening in the first place, then even if you do have bovine milk or have some other protein fragment that comes from a different source, as long as there's no permeable gut, then those protein fragments will get fully digested and then the ones that you can't completely absorb will just end up in, the, in, in, the, in your poop. Fascinating. <clears throat> and you're able to talk like that because you went and got a PhD in biochemistry. That's what I do. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> you were going to go be a mechanical engineer at NASA and then type 1 diabetes happened and that changed your life and off you went to Berkeley to get your PhD? Yeah, so I actually did work at NASA for two years. So what happened was that I graduated Stanford. I went to work at NASA for two years as an aeronautical engineer, and I was at the NASA Ames Research Center right in your backyard. So I was, I was living in the local area, I was working there, and uh, I was like, I was kind of like split in my head, because on one hand I was doing engineering, which is what I loved, but then on the other hand I had this like personal experiment where I was changing my diet and trying to figure out why my insulin sensitivity was changing so rapidly and trying to find an optimal way to be able to control my blood glucose using a combination of food and reduced insulin use. So this was this like fascinating biological experiment and then my like engineering work. And as I was going through this process, I was just like, you know what? I wish I knew more about biology because then I could, I could put a little bit more of an analysis, like a rigorous analysis and understanding like what's actually happening inside of like, how is my thyroid gland talking to my pancreas? Are they even communicating with each other? How's my brain talking to my muscles? Is my liver communicating with my gut, you know? And so in the process of working at NASA, I just started picking up books. I just started reading about nutritional biochemistry and molecular and cellular biology. And then I went to, uh, just I enrolled in getting prerequisite coursework so that I could like really study towards a PhD program. And then after I had two years of work underneath my belt, I then applied for, you know, I applied to like five or six different schools across the country. And I went to Berkeley and there at Berkeley I ended up meeting one of the world's authorities on carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, Mark Hellerstein, who is without question one of the smartest human beings on this planet. I mean, that guy is just a, is a ridiculous. He's like literally, he's Goodwill Hunting, like a real life version of Goodwill Hunting. Rational, honest discussion, and you know, going going for the data solves the problem. He's so smart that when he talks, probably similar to Steve Jobs in some contexts, where he's so smart that when he talks, I literally was like scribbling things down so I wouldn't forget them. And then I have to go study them afterwards. And I was like, what is he talking about? I don't understand, right? Anyway, long story short, I got to work with him for five years. And that kind of taught me how to think. And then since that moment, you know, since he knew my personal story, we were doing a bunch of carbohydrate metabolism, biology experiments in, you know, laboratory mice and rats, and just really investigating insulin resistance more and deeper. I then, when I graduated, I ended up meeting Robbie somewhere around the same time. 
and recognized that he was living, he, ha he was the only other human being that I knew who was living with type 1 diabetes and had transitioned to a plant-based diet. So he, we were living like parallel lives effectively. And at that point I was like, oh shit, like why don't people know this information? I mean, I can sit here and I can drone on about the research all day long, but like, it doesn't matter because people don't understand what to do. They just go on Instagram and they find ketogenic diets and that's what they do. So like, what if we were to try and create something that actually impacted real people and uh, the two of us joined forces to do it? And uh, I'm so glad we did because it's touched a lot of people's lives at this point and yeah. you know, we're only getting started to a certain extent. Yeah, it really has. And Robbie, you got diabetes when you were uh, 12, 14, something like that? Yeah, I was actually, <clears throat> I was 12 and I was just about to turn 13. So it was January 26th of 2000. And I'll, I'll never forget the day. My older brother all, actually also has type 1 diabetes. So I was very familiar with the condition. Steven. And that's right, Stephen. You, you do your research, Chris. <laughs> um, so Stephen. Nine years uh, older, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> I love it. Um, so I basically, I self-diagnosed myself. I told my mom, I was like, mom, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have diabetes, just like Steve. I'm, I'm thirsty all the time. I'm going to the bathroom like crazy. She said, no, no, don't be silly. You don't have diabetes. I said, okay, I just continue with my life. And she was out of town. We were living in Minnesota at the time. My mom and dad were in Florida looking for homes because we were going to move to Florida. And she calls to check in and she says, hey, how you doing? I said, well, Last night I was cramping, I couldn't sleep. She said, okay, go upstairs, use your brother's meter and test yourself. And I was well over 400. And as a person who is non-diabetic, you really shouldn't be above 140. So right then and there, my brother said, yep, you have type one diabetes, pack your bag, you're gonna be in the hospital for a few nights. So we went to the general doctor first, then we went to the hospital and my parents came back the next day. And my dad just said, hey, it's just an inconvenience. You can still accomplish whatever you want in your life. And I think I received a great benefit of being the second person who was diagnosed with type 1 because my parents were already familiar with it. They, were, they knew it's going to be okay. So I did get to receive a benefit there in the beginning. And I appreciated that. So what are the odds that it would happen to two brothers in the same family? Is there any kind of familial grouping in the disease? You know, or is it just that's a great question. thousand people are diagnosed every year? So Yeah, I don't know the statistics. But I'm sure there is some sort of connection, but I don't remember the statistics very well. I'd have to look them up, Chris. So in your book, you both said, uh, as I was feeling sorry for you reading your stories, and then you both came out and said, no, this is, diabetes is one of the best things that ever happened to you. And I was like, what? Um, did I read that right? So explain yourselves. No doubt. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of people think about diabetes as, as, this unfortunate condition that they either were predestined to receive because it's uh, it's within their family lineage, you know? A lot, you hear people say this all the time now, say, oh, well, my dad had type two diabetes, therefore I know I'm going to get it. My grandfather and my grandmother both had type two diabetes, therefore it's in my family, right? So people have this mindset that if it's present in, in your parents or your grandparents, then you will, it will happen to you, it's just a question of time. Uh, and then people who have uh, type one diabetes or type 1.5 diabetes, the sort of adult onset version of type one diabetes, um, they suffer from an autoimmune reaction like we talked about, and the autoimmune reaction is something that just kind of literally happens to you one day. And there's nothing that you can do to predict whether or not you're gonna develop an autoimmune blood glucose problem, it just sort of happens and before you know it, all of a sudden your glucose is alarmingly high. You go to the doctor, you end up in the hospital, you're in diabetic ketoacidosis and now all of a sudden you have to inject insulin. So there's this feeling like, you know, it's kind of inevitable and it's gonna happen to you one day. But the genetic argument is true only in the case of type one autoimmune diabetes. So there is a strong linkage between, you know, if your parent had it, your chances of developing type 1 diabetes are significantly increased. Does it mean it's going to happen? No, not necessarily, because it's a combination of your genetics plus your environment as well, right? So there's epigenetic programming, which happens from your environment. It determines what types of viruses you're exposed to. It determines what food is in your, uh, in your daily regimen, and it determines what, what you do on a daily basis. Um, but in the case of type 2 diabetes, most people, again, they think that it's a, a genetic predetermined condition. There's, there's a genetic... Uh, predisposition towards developing 
uh, insulin resistance, prediabetes, and type 2 diabetes, but just because a parent had it or a grandparent had it does not mean by any stretch of imagination that you're going to develop it because, again, more than autoimmune versions, what you eat, how you take care of your body, what you choose not to eat, how much alcohol you drink, whether you smoke, whether you move your body, uh, how much vitamin D you're exposed to, whether you sleep, whether you're stressed, all of that stuff matters. And so point being is that the overwhelming majority of people living with any form of diabetes have this feeling that, you know, oh, I just got dealt a bad card and now I have this thing. And then they become a victim to life with diabetes. And that life with diabetes can then uh, turn into a, a collection of chronic diseases. Oftentimes people with diabetes end up developing multiple chronic diseases, including hypertension, high cholesterol. Some go on to develop congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease. Some end up with fatty liver disease. Some end up with chronic kidney disease. Some end up with cognitive decline over the course of 20, 30, 50 years. And so it's, it's understandable that emotionally you might feel like you're on this one-way track towards a decreased quality of life. But the truth is that diabetes can become a superpower. And the way that I decided to change my perspective and the way that Robbie has also decided to change his perspective is to say, you know what? Uh, okay, fine, I got dealt a, a bad card. No big deal. I woke up one morning and I had type one diabetes. Now I have to inject insulin. Woe is me, right? I could literally spend the next 60 years of my life depressed and anxious and frustrated. Or I could just say, you know what? I'm just gonna make the best out of this. I'm just gonna do whatever I possibly can. I'm gonna learn as much as I possibly can. And I'm gonna try and help out as many other people as I possibly can, because this is actually not that big of a deal, right? If you, when you don't have the answer to a problem, the problem can become a fixation, it can become an anxiety, and it can destroy you mentally. When you work towards finding a solution, then all of a sudden the problem is no longer that big of a problem. It doesn't present as an anxiety and you can actually truly enjoy your life. So I decided that I was gonna learn everything that I possibly could. And in the process of doing that, I got empowered to recognize that living with type one diabetes is truly a superpower because you carry this blood glucose meter with you, right? Robbie has a CGM, some people have insulin pumps, some people have blood glucose meters, some people have insulin pens. It doesn't really matter. Some combination of things that you have on you is telling you what your blood glucose is as frequently as you want it to. And then you also have the tools to be able to control what food you're eating and how much insulin you're dosing yourself if that's necessary for you, right? You, Chris, as a perfect example, or anybody who is non-diabetic, you don't have a health meter in front of you. Right? Unless you I've been thinking about CGM. Out. You've been thinking about getting a CGM? Well, uh, so Michael Snyder, the professor at Stanford, who's uh, he's on the cover of the recent issue of Stanford Magazine for all the instrumentation he wears and promotes, he's in the med school, said, I didn't realize I was pre-diabetic until I wore a CGM. And he said, and I went and had lunch and had pulled pork with some barbecue sauce on it, and my you know, blood glucose went over 300. So now there's this kind of movement, you know, maybe you could answer this, Robbie, that there's a, a lot of doctors online who just say, you got to wear a CGM and never let your blood glucose get above 120. So okay. if the apples put it over 120, stop eating apples. Okay, I would love to answer this and I'm excited. But Chris, I do want to answer your original question. I went to Dr. Google and I trust that this fact is accurate. So there is only a 5% chance that first degree relatives of a person with type one will also develop the disease. So not that common. And it could be lifestyle. It could be exactly. So we are seeing a rise in autoimmune conditions that researchers don't fully understand. And there is definitely theory out there that it could be our lifestyle and our environment and you know, some of the toxins that have also been introduced to our environment. So it's, it's an unknown. But yeah, lifestyle. So I love talking about CGMs. And you know, I forget exactly what year I started wearing it, but I do remember that when I strapped on the Dexcom for the first time and started seeing my blood glucose every five minutes, like you, it just opens up this whole new world of like what's happening in between meals. What's happening while I'm sleeping? What's happening with various forms of exercise? Like to really see the graph and and know that not just the, you know, the elevation, but like the degree of elevation. And like, is it two arrows up or is it one arrow up or is it one to the side, is it flat? Like, it's just fascinating. 
And I really, I understand why they're becoming so popular. Now they're becoming more affordable and the, and the public is starting to wear them, just like general people and people who don't necessarily have diabetes. So this is bringing up a lot of confusion. And this confusion was also present even before the CGMs, particularly with people with diabetes, because it's one of the few chronic conditions where you can self-monitor meal by meal. If you have heart disease, you don't have an objective number that you go, okay, wow, if I ate this meal, did my heart disease get better or worse? Did my kidney disease get better or worse? You're not sure. But with diabetes, anybody can get a blood glucose meter, test themselves and say, oh, wow, like I just ate a banana. My blood glucose went above 200. It stayed there. Then the banana is the, the problem. How, how could anybody tell me any different? I just proved it to you. There's a common phrase in the world of diabetes, the numbers don't lie, the meter doesn't lie, it tells a story. And that's why you'll hear a lot from the community who's you know, trying to limit or avoid carbohydrates. The problem is, this is an observation just the short term. They're, they're not understanding what led to them not being able to metabolize carbohydrate efficiently, particularly whole food carbohydrates. So like a, a banana, a, you know, a potato, rice, beans, these foods. And so that's really what our entire platform is built upon, is helping people understand what is insulin resistance, what makes you become more insulin resistant and then unable to metabolize these foods. So for me, it's, it's just been a fun experience. And uh, we started Mastering Diabetes because we both had personal transformations and then we looked into the research and found out, okay, wait a minute, it's not just us. But nonetheless, I still, we still enjoy sharing our, our personal experience. So I, I followed a plant-based ketogenic diet and I'm very diligent with numbers and using the various softwares to figure out what's going on. And so I can now, with all the knowledge I have now, I can sort of historically look at data and figure out, okay, when I followed that plant-based ketogenic diet, I ate, call it about um, 70 grams of total carbohydrate per day, which if you take out the fiber and you take out fructose, you end up with about 30 grams of glucose. Okay, 30 grams of glucose per day. So if I needed, let's say roughly, um, you know, 30 units of insulin to metabolize the 30 grams of glucose over the course of 24 hours, that's a one to one ratio, okay? And then, so now I transition to this low fat plant-based whole food diet and I'm eating well over 700 grams of carbohydrate per day. And a good amount of that is fiber and a good amount of fructose as well. So we now have software that, such as Chronometer where you can remove those and just figure out how much glucose am I consuming, okay? And then so I, I did the math and my ratio now of on average, I can I inject one unit of insulin to consume 10 grams of glucose. That is a 900% change in insulin sensitivity. And so like Cyrus was saying with this superpower and this data we have, People with type one diabetes in particular have an amazing amount of data on a meal by meal basis. We test our blood glucose so we have the glucose numbers. We count the carbohydrate we're consuming so we know how much insulin to inject. And we know and can quantify how much insulin are we using. Whereas if you're not living with type one, even if you have type two or you know, non-insulin non dependent type two or prediabetes, you don't know how much insulin your pancreas is secreting. So you could make the argument that, oh, maybe I saw an insulin spike and that's why my blood glucose stayed steady. But with type one, we have this, this data. I have, a C, you know, I have a C peptide test to show that I'm producing pretty much zero insulin, an undetectable amount. My C peptide is less than 0 0.1, so, or 0 0.01. Um, so we can see with these CGMs, with the insulin, with the carbohydrate we're consuming, what lifestyle choices make you more insulin sensitive and more insulin resistant. And, and the data is, it's, it's shockingly consistent. I mean, I think in the world of science and, and biology, sometimes it's hard to say something is always like 100% certain. But when it comes to eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, reducing your dietary fat intake, and following the Mastering Diabetes Method and employing these principles, I have yet to see somebody who did not become more insulin sensitive. I have yet to run to that person, the thousands of people who've been through our coaching program, who didn't see that insulin works more efficiently when you reduce your dietary fat intake. And that all comes back to you know CGMs, and we're seeing that consistently with our clients, and, and Cyrus wants to add something, so please go ahead. Yeah, so everything that Robbie's saying is perfectly uh, accurate. So 
let's let's play a game here just to make sure that you know we're all on the same page. So imagine you're living in a non-diabetic state, and you would know that because you got your A1C tested recently, and it tested at a 5.3%. Your fasting glucose is 75 or 85, okay? It's well within the normal range. So you're considered non-diabetic by all measures um, that given to you by a doctor. Now, fast forward two years, and your A1C, instead of being 5.3%, is now 5.9%. And your fasting glucose, instead of being 85, is now 103. Okay, so what you're doing is you're entering into the prediabetes range. You find that when you eat food, when you look at your CGM, now your post-meal blood glucose values go as high as 130 to 140. Okay? If you were following the standard conventional wisdom that you had presented earlier, which is that your blood glucose should never go over 120, which is what a lot of these CGM companies are now saying for non-diabetic individuals. If you're following that information, then what you would do is you would say, oh, well, I think I'm eating too many carbs because I know that carbs or carbohydrate is actually what's elevating my blood glucose. So what you would do is you would limit your carbohydrate intake. You'd, you'd reduce the amount of fruits and potatoes and legumes and whole grains in your diet. And then you would substitute that with either foods that are higher in protein or foods that are higher in fat. Those are your only two options, right? So you would limit your carbohydrate intake while eating slightly more protein and or slightly more fat. And over the course of time, you would naturally gravitate towards a more, we'll call it, you know, a lower carbohydrate diet, whether it was a paleo diet or a ketogenic diet, who cares? But the idea is that you'd be lowering your carbohydrate intake, right? So when people do that, in the short term, what they'll find is that when they limit their carbohydrate intake, well, guess what? Their fasting glucose went down, their A1C is likely to go down over the course of the next few months. And their post-meal blood glucose is no longer 130 to 140. Their post-meal blood glucose is now 106. So in the short term, you would start eating more protein and fat-rich foods, and you take a look at your CGM, you'd be like, hey, things are moving in the right direction. I'm clearly solving the problem. Things are, you know, I'm becoming more non-diabetic, at least on paper. But what the research actually demonstrates is the opposite, is that if you were to increase your protein and or fat consumption at the expense of carbohydrate, in other words, if you were to play the carbohydrate avoidance game, which is the way we like to refer to it, then you'll get better short-term results. You'll get improved glycemic responses when you eat, uh, when you eat food. But then in addition to that, uh, you are also likely to lose a little bit of weight because this is generally what happens when people eat low carbohydrate diets. And that unto itself is gonna improve your glucose even more. So it's this kind of feed forward cycle. But here's the problem. The evidence-based research also demonstrates that people who eat more protein and or more fat, especially people who are eating more animal-based protein and or animal-based fat, actually end up with a higher incidence of chronic disease. They end up with more cardiovascular disease, more mortality from cardiovascular disease. They end up with a higher risk for diabetes, a higher risk for mortality from diabetes, and they end up with a higher all-cause mortality, okay? Premature death from any cause. And I'm talking about eating more protein and more fat-rich foods over the course of time. Not in the first six months, but over the course of two to five to seven to 12 to 16 years, right? That's what the epidemiological research shows. So if you follow this methodology that my glucose should never go over 120 because that's what the CGM company told me, then you're likely to gravitate towards a lifestyle that's actually gonna worsen your health over the course of time. But if instead you recognize that the reason that your post-meal blood glucose is increasing and the reason your A1C and your fasting glucose is increasing is not because you're eating too many carbohydrates, likely. It's because you have become less carbohydrate tolerant, aka because you have become more insulin resistant. So now we have to figure out what causes that. We gotta back up one step and say, what is causing a reduced ability to metabolize carbohydrate? And then you gotta solve that problem. Again, you look in the research, what causes a reduced ability to metabolize carbohydrate? The answer is increased dietary fat. So when you consume, that, that's, the, that's the number one culprit, okay? The most repeatable culprit is increased saturated fat intake. And then you also have other ancillary variables, including uh, number two, less activity, so a more sedentary lifestyle. Then you also have things like alcohol can cause it. You can have overconsumption of calories that can cause it. Weight gain can cause it. So there's a whole bunch of variables, but the, the predominant variable, the one that's the most powerful, is the fact that you're consuming an excess quantity of saturated fat. So the very thing 
that is reducing your carbohydrate tolerance in the first place is the thing that most people gravitate towards when they see a higher blood glucose value. And that's the problem with this information that so many, that's, that's circulated in the general public that says, if your blood glucose is greater than 115 or 120 after a meal, then reduce your carbohydrate intake. It unfortunately leads to more uh, chronic disease, even though the results may appear to be better in the short term. So you said something important that <clears throat> caught my attention in there. You said saturated fat. <clears throat> but mm -hmm. among your red light foods in mastering diabetes is, mm -hmm. are the oils, mm -hmm. which are unsaturated. So can you guys talk about that? Sure. So oils tend to be, the oils still have saturated fat in them. So there's, there's, it's not that they're saturated fat free. It's just that they have a higher proportion of unsaturated fat than they do saturated fat. And it depends on which oil we're talking about. So coconut oil is a perfect example. That, that oil actually is predominantly saturated fat with small amounts of unsaturated fat. But for the rest of the oils, whether you're looking at olive oil or canola oil or rice bran oil, um, those tend to be predominantly unsaturated with still a saturated fat component for sure. So the thing with oil that can become problematic is the, there's, there's two things to pay attention to when it comes to fat consumption. Number one, the total number of grams of fat that enter your mouth per day. Okay, so your total fat content is the most important indicator. And then secondarily, it's your saturated fat content as a proportion of that total fat. So we have over, empirically discovered that people who consume generally over approximately 30 grams of fat per day, of total fat per day, end up having carbohydrate metabolism problems. Okay, and of course that number is variable. That number is variable based off of your age, your sex, your height, your disease history, uh, how active you are, but as a general rule of thumb, somewhere around the number 30 is what we have discovered experimentally with many people that uh, it seems to be sort of the tipping point. So if you can control your total fat intake to be less than 30 grams approximately per day, then you end up in the insulin sensitive zone. If your carbohydrate, I'm sorry, if your fat intake is greater than 30 grams per day, then you end up developing more insulin resistance and more blood glucose irregularities over the course of time. So that's the most important indicator. Now, the second most important indicator is saturated fat. And saturated fat has been uh, demonstrated both in, in animal models as well as in humans um, to be a very, very powerful uh, insulin, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's, it's the one component of your diet that most powerfully blocks insulin action. Okay, and I have to choose my words very carefully when I say this because sometimes if you use the word insulin resistance, people get pissed off. But the idea here is that when there is a increase in saturated fat at the level of the muscle and at the level of your liver, saturated fat blocks the glucose uptake process. It blocks the glucose uptake process because it inhibits insulin action in both tissues. And so there's, there's a wide collection of research by Gerald Shulman and his colleagues, by uh, Rodin and his colleagues, by Philip Randall and his colleagues all the way back in the 1960s. And the, 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 uh, the research actually dates back to the 1920s, going all the way back to J.P. Hemsworth and beyond. So the, the presence of saturated fat is, is the most problematic, but we have to sort of interpret the presence of saturated fat in the context of the presence of, of total fat. And that's why when you're consuming oils, to answer your question, how can they become problematic when they're predominantly unsaturated? Well, generally people who consume oil in their diet are well over the threshold of 30 grams of fat per day, total fat per day. Because one tablespoon, one teaspoon of oil can easily contribute between 14 and 20 grams of fat in one serving. So if you do that once or twice a day, boom, right there, you're over the threshold. And then in addition to that, if you sum total all the saturated fat that you get from other foods as well, then that puts you well into 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 grams per day. Fascinating. So maybe I should ask you first about the program that you have on what Mastering Diabetes is. So it's a great book. It's quite a deep book. Um, it's a long read. I listen to it both <laughs> on a motorcycle as an audio book, and then I reread it on my Kindle so I could 
mark passages and all that. But it, it's quite a deep book, and I and I really appreciate it. And by the way, I like the fact that you guys alternated your narration on the audiobook. That was really great. And the funny thing is, I remember where I was when I hear certain things. I don't know why I have that association, but I do. I do the exact and, same uh, thing. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I had this white knuckle. I was riding a motorcycle that had a sidecar. It was a vintage sort of thing. And they're a little bit tippy. And I was going to the Mojave Desert, and, and the winds across the freeway were like 70 miles an hour. So it was blowing me all over the road. And I'm listening to you guys thinking, I'd rather have diabetes than crash my motorcycle <laughs> on the freeway right now. Anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, but it's also a program. And it must have been affected a little bit by COVID. Is, has it been hard to meet in person? So you're doing it virtually or? Describe Mastering Diabetes program. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I appreciate you asking, and uh, I appreciate all the work you've done. You made a great video about us. If people listening to this haven't seen it, it's about, it wasn't about us. It was about comparing some of the diabetes experts. I mean, maybe put a link to click that on the screen. Um, it was great. So I appreciate that. We're really, really proud of what we've put together. It's called the Mastering Diabetes Method. And so <clears throat> we do offer a coaching program to help people implement the Mastering Diabetes Method. And since we started in 2017, we've always been digital. So it's always been online and accessible for people anywhere in the world to join our coaching program, work with our amazing team of coaches and get the support they need. And then our coaches who will sort of, you know, help our members work in conjunction with their doctor. And so we're really proud of that in the sense of like, we are showing amazing examples and, and guiding people towards changing their life. And they are then educating their doctor, but just by leading by example. And that's been really fun. But the Master Diabetes Method itself, it has four components. Number one is low fat plant-based whole food nutrition. Number two is the use of intermittent fasting for those who enjoy that and want to incorporate it. We I don't have... enjoy it and I don't want to incorporate it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you see, you're the perfect example of somebody who doesn't really need to, you know? I mean, we could do a whole uh, your show on that, and, and maybe we should, but um, you do fast every night when you sleep. Um, so we have intermittent fasting, then we have daily movement, and then number four is decision trees. So those are the four components. And through working with you know, our team and our coaches, we also add in a lot of the additional nuances that are necessary, you know, whether it comes to using meditation, whether how, do, how does sleep impact your insulin sensitivity? How does stress impact your insulin sensitivity? So we're really addressing this on all fronts. And we really do take maximizing insulin sensitivity as our mission. It's not like, oh, let's have small improvements. Let's go, you know, jump a little bit. And that's what's kind of confusing in the research. And so we can even, you can go to research studies who are citing that, oh yeah, even you know, some olive oil somehow improved its own sensitivity. Well, there's, a, there's first off flaws with the, the study itself and like how they're assessing its own sensitivity, but also compared to what? And so yeah, you can see some improvements, but with our program and same thing with the ketogenic diet, like maybe they lost weight. So it gets confusing, but nonetheless, we address insulin resistance in every facet possible in the most maximal way you can go. And so that's why our results are so extraordinary. And so, you know, there's a lot of plant-based diets out there. There's a lot of people that's growing. Every single expert or doctor has their own little version, their own little nuance. But what we do is really focused on making insulin work as efficiently as possible. And that's hence why no oil. It's just far better to have some olives in your diet than to eat olive oil. It's far better for insulin sensitivity and us being type ones and working with a lot of, you know, type ones, you can see that so objectively, so clearly with the amount of insulin that's required with what happens on their CGMs, 24, 48, 72 hours after having a small amount of oil versus having no oil in their diet and learning how to cook without oil, learning how to cook with, you know, vegetable broth. It, it's the compared to that becomes the really important conversation here, depending on what somebody's goals are and where they're going. So our program, it's all about helping people reach their goals. We like to say we're not the food police. You know, let's say somebody wanted to have a little oil in their diet, or they need to have you know, some wine here, there, and that gets them on the program overall, that helps them maintain it. Then that's fine, like we're gonna work with you to make sure this is sustainable, make sure you can do this for the long term, I mean, I've been doing this for well over 16 years. How many is it for you now, Cyrus? 18, 19? 
Yeah, it's been a total of 19 years for me. 19 years. So, you know, I do like to point out that we're not really new on the scene. Uh, we have been uh, applying this, learning about it, studying it for a long time and have been able to, you know, learn and, and network with the giants uh, whose shoulders we stand upon who've also been doing it for the long term. And that's something that's a big uh, tenet of our program. Like we are setting you up for long term success. We know how to do that. We know what the science shows. And so we have different coaching, whether it's private coaching, small group coaching, large group coaching, um, educational programs, you know, do it yourself program, a weekly meal plan. We just give people what they want, what they need. We, we hear their feedback and we, we see the requests and we deliver what, what people need to succeed again for, in the long term. So if you just eat like a very high fat diet because fat doesn't raise your blood sugar at all, so you control your blood sugar, keep it below 120 at all times, you're reading your CGM and it just doesn't spike, but you're, living, you're still living in a state of insulin resistance, right? And you're gonna to try to do that for your life. There are some examples though, like Dr. Bernstein had a big profile, wrote books and things. He was kind of you guys before you guys came along. And his program that he sticks to is 50 grams of carbs per day. You're going to eat meat and fat. He's 87. He's still hitting the gym and looking okay. So, and he, he's got success stories too. So how do you counter this? You know, there's other examples like Verta Health has raised all this money, you know, to... Right. You know, I think they're valued at a billion dollars or something just to get people to eat fat and keep the blood sugar down, but not to reverse the insulin resistance. Sorry, so you got this next, but I just want to say real quick, Dr. Bernstein is a living legend. Okay, like, you, like I respect that guy so much. Like I want everybody to know we are we are not against anybody's program. We're not trying to bring something down or like or if, if you're if you love it, it's working for you. You're happy. That's great. Like kudos to you. That's awesome. Um, mad respect for everything he's done. We actually, in general, would agree on a lot more things than we don't agree upon. Um, and that guy is also the reason we have blood glucose meters. He was the reason he went and, and fought for that to actually become a reality for us to be able to like self treat ourselves in a, in a world where that's not what the doctors wanted for, for monetary reasons. Uh, it's amazing. So kudos to him and kudos to all the people who are you know learning from him and you know the, maybe the new modern day modern day ketogenic experts like you are you're getting rid of fast food like you're moving your body you're you're becoming really diligent about everything you're putting in your body and you're staying in a state of ketosis fasting. like yeah like like that's amazing like like we we respect um, but nonetheless you know when the question comes up we are still going to answer you know why why would we choose not to do that and why do we want to make sure we offer and present another option to the world so that you have a choice? The reason is the research is clear on your statistical chances of what's going to happen when you include more meat and dairy, more eggs, and reduce your consumption, limit your intake of fruits, intact whole grains, beans. Like you start looking at epidemiological research, you start looking at you know mechanistical research, you look at like stuff. Uh, on like a cellular level, you start looking at the, the breadth of research, it becomes pretty darn clear that eating, omitting these whole plant foods is not your best statistical chance of reducing your chance of developing the number one cause of death for people living with diabetes, which is heart disease. And if we just stopped there and only talked about what you can do to reduce your chances of developing heart disease, I believe the case is already made. So that's my answer and Cyrus can continue. Yeah. Okay. So a simple way to think about this is that someone like Dr. Bernstein uh, is, he's, uh, he's an outlier. He's an outlier. And I, and I mean that with all due respect, he's uh, taking phenomenal care of his, of his own personal health and especially his blood glucose values over the course of many decades. And as a result of that, he's a shining example of what could happen over the course of time if you eat a ketogenic diet. Okay. But He's an N of one story in the same way that I'm an N of one story, and Robbie is an N of one story. So if you're going to sort of base your conclusions and try and decide what you're going to do, it's instead of just looking at uh, N of one stories, what you want to do is actually take a look at a wider collection of research and see what happens to people in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term. So for that, you have to go to the scientific research. Now, if you look in the scientific research, for studies that have followed people eating a ketogenic diet, 
okay? And when I say long-term research, I'm talking about research that is conducted over a minimum of five years, hopefully closer to 10, maybe 15 years. So if you look for ketogenic studies that have lasted between five to 10 to 15 years, guess how many you will find? Not very many. Yeah, that's what I thought. There, there are none, okay? There are no studies that have gone, uh, that have studied the ketogenic diet in over that duration. So that's cause for concern number one. The question is, well, why would that be the case? Right? Has it not been around for long enough? Maybe, but the ketogenic diet, the name the ketogenic diet is just the most recent iteration of the very low carbohydrate diet. But the ketogenic diet has been around for a long time, ever since Atkins first invented it back in the 1970s. So it has been around for 50 years at this point, but yet we don't have any, uh, we have zero long-term studies. Now, if you take a look at Verta Health as an example, I know Sammy, the CEO, he's a good guy. He's a really good guy, there's no question about him. But what if we could reverse it completely? That's the goal and health moonshot of my guest today, Sami Inkinen, the co-founder of Verda, which Startup Health backed in 2020. Inkinen is not just any health tech founder. Before starting Verda, he disrupted the real estate market by co-founding Trulia, which he then sold to Zillow for $2.5 billion. So anything that I say here about Verda is not meant to be a personal attack on him or anybody at the company. But if you take a look at their research, what you'll find is that their longest study is two years what their ketogenic intervention did was it lowered their total carbohydrate intake in substitution for more fat and more protein-rich foods, likely from animal sources. And what they found was that there was a dramatic reduction in the need for insulin, for exogenous insulin. There was like an 80-something percent reduction in insulin requirements, which is great. However, if you take a look at their fasting blood glucose values, their fasting blood glucose values are indicative of having type 2 diabetes because they're still greater than 125 milligrams per deciliter. It's not great. Cyrus offered to take us through the Verda paper, but we had to do it on a different day, and here it is. The paper that I want to draw your attention to is this paper right here published in 2019 in June. In this paper, the scientists at Verda are reporting on the results of a two-year non-randomized clinical trial that involved 262 people that went through their education and coaching program versus 87 participants, all of which were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And these 87 participants uh, went through the standard of care recommendations given by the American Diabetes Association. So I'm going to fast forward to the data that they present at this, uh, in this paper at two years. And the reason I chose this paper in particular is because there's a significant amount of data that demonstrates that a ketogenic diet can definitely lower your blood glucose, lower your blood pressure, uh, accelerate body weight loss, and uh, lower your triglyceride level within uh, in the short term, within the first 10 weeks uh, to three months to six months. And Verda themselves had actually published a paper demonstrating this exact thing, which is that when they transitioned patients to their ketogenic approach, uh, they got dramatic improvements in their glycemia within the first 10 weeks, which is great. But if we zoom out and we say, okay, well, what happens to these people over the course of two years? The story becomes both promising and also not promising at the same time. So the data that you see on the screen right here presents what happened to individuals from their baseline values all the way through the two-year time point. So we have three columns. We have baseline, we have what happened at one year, and then we also have what happened at two years. If you follow just their A1C values, what you'll find is that their baseline A1C values were approximately 7.7 .7 as, uh, as, a, as a group. That 7.7 .7 value then decreased by 1.3% to get to 6.3 at the one-year marker, but then it actually increased back up to 6.7 at the two-year marker. So the goal is to take these individuals and lower their A1C to less than 6.5% if you're going to claim that these individuals no longer have type 2 diabetes. And in an ideal world, their A1C would actually come lower than 5.7% because that would indicate that they no longer have prediabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. But what you see is that their A1C fell from 7.7 .7 down to 6.7%. And an A1C value of 6.7% indicates that they're still living with type 2 diabetes. The, the reason why this is important is because the conclusion in this paper is that they got a significant proportion of the people who went through their education and coaching program to reverse type 2 diabetes altogether. But if you take a look at just the A1C value, you'll see that they're actually still living with an A1C that's, that's congruent with that of type 2 diabetes. So that's uh, confusing point number one. Confusing point number two is that their fasting glucose started at 163 
And then at the one-year marker fell to 127, and then by the two-year marker was now back up to 134. So a fasting glucose greater than 125 is considered type 2 diabetes. Again, their fasting glucose is 134 at the two-year marker, suggesting again that these individuals are still living with type 2 diabetes. In addition to that, if we scroll down even further into the research, what we will find is that their LDL cholesterol actually went in the wrong direction. Their total cholesterol also went in the wrong direction. Their, at baseline, their total cholesterol was 184 milligrams per deciliter. And after two years, their uh, total cholesterol had actually risen to 194. And their LDL cholesterol was at 103 to begin with, and it actually rose to 114. Other markers of their cardiovascular metabolism improved. Their HDL cholesterol went up from 41 to 49, and their triglyceride concentration fell from 197 down to 153. We know from ample scientific evidence that the total amount of LDL cholesterol in circulation is the most, uh, the most important indicator of your future cardiac disease risk. I'll say that one more time. We know from ample scientific evidence that's conducted in meta-analysis of over 1 million individuals that the total amount of LDL cholesterol in circulation, regardless of whether it's small dense particles or large fluffy particles, the total amount of LDL cholesterol is an independent predictor of your risk for a future cardiac event. So for an LDL cholesterol to increase over the course of some type of nutritional intervention is alarming because what that indicates is that even if other markers of their cardiovascular metab metabolism are improving, their risk for the development of coronary artery disease and heart disease is actually increasing. And finally, if we take a look at their two other indicators of their metabolism, we'll see that the beta hydroxybutyrate concentration, this is a marker that's used to determine whether or not an individual is living in a ketotic state or not. The number that you're looking for is greater than 0.5. If your beta hydroxybutyrate concentration is greater than 0.5, what that means is that you're in a state of ketosis and that state of ketosis is then supposed to confer a number of uh, short-term and long-term benefits. At baseline, participants had a beta hydroxybutyrate concentration of 0.18, which indicates they were not in a ketotic state. And at the two-year marker, their beta hydroxybutyrate concentration had only risen to 0.27, which indicates, again, they're still not in a ketotic state. And they address this in the paper where they say that only a, uh, approximately 50% of the individuals in their program were actually living in a ketotic state, which demonstrates that at the two-year marker, the adherence to their ketotic protocol was actually quite low. And that's, that's alarming because a lot of the research that's conducted in the world of, keto, of ketogenic diets is actually short-term research simply because it is hard to adhere to a ketosis regimen. The final thing I'll say about this paper is that these high-sensitivity C-reactive protein concentrations are also alarming. At the beginning of the study, individuals had a high-sensitivity C-reactive protein of 7.45, which is a very accurate measure of total body inflammation. So any number greater than approximately one nanomole is considered elevated. And they started with a 7.45 nanomolar concentration. So that means that there's significant total body inflammation. At the end of the two-year period, their C-reactive protein had fallen to 4.69, which again is an indicator that they're still in an inflammatory state. Yes, it did decrease. However, anything greater than one indicates that there's still a significant amount of total body inflammation that hasn't been fully addressed. So this is alarming to me and something that is well worth talking about because the way that people talk about the Verda approach in the public is different than what the actual science says. The science doesn't look that promising, but what people say is, oh wow, Verda is reducing type 2 diabetes incidence. Verda is reversing type 2 diabetes, and that's the phraseology that they use on their website, in their marketing, and also uh, within prominent scientific publications. And uh, we are the first company that has developed a treatment that can actually reverse the disease without surgery and get patients off of even costly medications like insulin, which is really unheard of. I'm in the middle of editing this episode and I'm actually shaken up by what I just heard. I wasn't expecting this. First, I went looking for Verda's definition of diabetes reversal and found it buried in the supplemental materials of this paper. An A1C below 6.5%, which the group didn't achieve, without medication except metformin. Wait, what? Most papers conclude metformin reduces A1C by 1.1%. 1 
So other patients going from A1Cs of 7.7 .7 to 6.7 could be entirely due to metformin. They say in the paper they kept all patients on metformin regardless of the progress they made unless there was a problem with the drug or the patients wanted off. I fired off an email to Cyrus asking if this was an accepted definition of diabetes reversal that metformin didn't count. And he said no, Verta came up with their own definition and it's bogus. I don't know why Cyrus didn't mention that when he took us through the paper, other than he's a nice guy who's trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Second, I fact-checked Cyrus' statement that half the group wasn't in ketosis. Here's what the paper says in black and white. Only 14.1% of patients achieved ketosis at two years into the study, despite all their coaching and encouragement to get there. And third, did you hear the CEO say they're the first company to develop a treatment that can actually reverse the disease and that's unheard of? I happen to like food and medical history books, and I'm having trouble counting all the companies that developed treatments to reverse type 2 diabetes long before Verda was founded. Robert Atkins wasn't the first when he wrote this book in 1972, but he was the best known, so I'll read what he had to say. I have treated 2,000 stable adult diabetics. I have never yet had to begin giving injections of insulin. The diet described in this book has been effective in bringing both the diabetes and overweight under control in every one of those 2,000 cases. I suppose it can happen that one day someone will walk in and be an exception, but so far it hasn't occurred. <laughs> I wonder what he would say 50 years later when the cases have become far more advanced. The company Dr. Atkins started went on to develop a type 2 diabetes treatment plan, and they used the terms reversal liberally. I've been giving away Neil Bernard's diabetes reversal without any medication book since 2006. I interviewed Eric Adams, the current mayor of New York, who reversed his diabetes at the Cleveland Clinic and wrote a book about it. If you Google diabetes reversal clinics, you'll find a plethora, some of which date back decades. I really don't like saying this, and Robbie and Cyrus never would because they're so nice, but when I heard Sammy speak, I picked up vibes of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. I'm becoming the first female tech billionaire. They compared her story with other young college dropouts like Mark Zuckerberg. But what they failed to acknowledge is that coding is something you can learn in your own time. Dropping out of a chemical engineering degree after just a few months doesn't qualify you to go and start a revolutionary medical company. But I'm a very big fanboy of companies in my area like Google, Apple, and Tesla who were built upon technology breakthroughs. But come on, Vert is built on very old diet plans which have been around since at least the early 1900s and have risen and fallen in popularity many times and gone by many names. Each time they become popular, they've been able to show great short-term results, but they've never been able to show great long-term results, quite the opposite. And that makes me wonder why Verda hasn't published more about this five-year study past the two-year mark in 2019 when the paper seemed to show the diet was no longer working. I hope you can forgive my interruption of this interview with Robbie and Cyrus, but I did it because they're too nice to say what I just said, and it makes me feel like a jerk. I didn't want to say it either, but if I don't, who will? Okay, back to the interview. I don't like anecdotes, but there's a testimonial in a comment section saying, I went with mm -hmm. keto diet for five years and I loved it. You know, big, all caps, loved it. Um, loved the food, loved everything about it. And then I had a heart attack. So uh, yeah, and there's, a, there's your uh, anecdote for the day. And just for clarity, um, I, I am not, in no way, shape, or form do I hold uh, the scientists or the business builders or the, the, the management team at Verda. Um, I, I'm not trying to speak ill of them in any way, shape, or form because I actually know members of their team and they're fantastic individuals and they're trying to do the right thing and there's nothing wrong with that. But w their foundation is built upon a ketogenic diet. And we know from ample scientific evidence that a ketogenic diet actually increases your risk for mortality from cardiovascular disease, from diabetes, and from cancer, and it also increases your risk for all-cause mortality. And I can get into that in a little bit more detail. So the people are good, the science is shaky, and as a result of that, those who do get good results usually get them in the short term, but then over the course of time, two years, five years, 10 years into the future, we see that their disease risk, their chronic disease risk has gone up dramatically, and that's something that everybody would like to avoid. So I'll bounce back to day one of the interview before proceeding to the rest of day two. Here's a question we got in the comments section from Linda Grace. I love the idea of eating a plant-based diet. I think it will contribute to my longevity, among other things. But I was a type 2 insulin-dependent diabetic for 30 years before I rebelled against my doctors and started eating the keto diet. In two years of keto, lots of animal foods and avocados, I lost 200 pounds. I'm trying to transition back to a more balanced whole food diet. However, a lot of the foods recommended for vegans are really problematic for me. Potatoes, grains, and beans drive my blood pressure up like crazy. 
I can handle most green vegetables and low glycemic index foods, but most tropical fruit, grapes, apples, etc., also drive up my blood sugars. I am daunted by the prospect of living entirely off of low glycemic index berries and green vegetables. Are there any doctors out there who can help a recovering carnivore like Robbie and Cyrus, please help. <laughs> a recovering carnivore, I think that's a great term actually. So let's say that you decided, all right, fine, I understand the research and I do wanna make a change. I'm either carnivorous now and I don't wanna be anymore or I'm low carbohydrate and I don't wanna be anymore, how do I do that, okay? So we teach people, just like you said, we want you to walk slowly. We want you to walk slowly for a number of reasons. Number one, if you make the change too fast to going from being you know, primarily carnivorous to primarily plant-based, it's going to be very hard to do. You're not gonna know what to buy at the grocery store. You're not gonna know how much to eat. You're not gonna know, your, your taste buds literally will not be satisfied when you're eating plant foods because they're not accustomed to it. Your digestive system will hate you. Uh, and um, it, can become, it can become this like large sort of logistical and emotional nightmare that most people who try the sort of cold turkey switch all of a sudden are like, oh my God, this is too difficult, I can't do this. This was a bad idea. And then their conclusion is, oh, well, those mastering diabetes guys don't know what they're talking about. Or this whole plant-based world doesn't know what they're talking about. This doesn't work. I tried it, trust me, it doesn't work. And the answer is, well, okay, you, you might have tried it, but number one, you made the transition too quickly. You can't really say that you've tried something unless you've been very systematic about it over the process of at least 90 days, if not more. So we're a fan of doing things systematically. Just like James Clear talks about in his book, Atomic Habits, okay? We're talking about micro habits that accumulate over the course of time to completely change the direction of your life. So I'm not gonna tell you to go change all your food in one shot because I know that it's not gonna work for you. I know that it's gonna cause you to be more anxious. I know that you're likely to just revert to your old habits and then you're gonna say, this is, this is silly. So what, I, what, what we teach people to do, which is actually like paramount in this process, is you gotta walk slowly. So we teach people, okay, let's change your breakfast to start. Okay, and, and when I say change your breakfast to start, we give you a whole collection of recipes and we teach you the methodology for trying to increase your carbohydrate intake and lower your fat and protein intake and get rid of all animal products. Do that for one meal and literally don't change your lunch, don't change your dinner, don't change your snacks, nothing. Leave it the same. You make one change and you let that change go until you start to get the hang of it. I want you to start to digest food properly. I want you to not have to go to the bathroom quickly. I want you to be able to think clearly after that meal. I want you to, to get a good blood glucose response from that one meal. I want you to practice that meal and figure out the logistics about it so that way you feel comfortable that you really, you have the, the AM hours down. After you do that, I mean, it could take a week, it could take three weeks, it could take a month, I don't care. It's not a race. Eventually you get to lunch, and then you fix your lunch. So now you got breakfast and you got lunch. That could take up another week or month. And then eventually you'll get to your dinner. That could take another week, that could take another month. And over the course of time, you've assembled your breakfast and your lunch and your dinner. And not only are you gonna be able to give your digestive system a little bit more time to adapt to a completely different collection of organic material, okay? More vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals, but you're also gonna be able to adapt to less protein and less fat and the true kicker in this is that the fiber, the literally the cellulose that you are putting into your mouth that comes prepackaged in all of these plant-rich foods can become very problematic for people that have been eating a low carbohydrate and or animal-based diet for a long period of time because they just, they don't have the machinery to be able to process foods that are complex that contain a significant amount of fiber. Okay, they don't have the digestive biochemistry inside of their small intestine to be able to unpack these foods properly. And then their microbiome doesn't have the, the digestive power to be able to manufacture cellulase to be able to break down those cellulosic fibers to turn them into short chain fatty acids and actually use those for signaling molecules. So you have to give yourself time, both from a mental and emotional perspective, but also from a physiological perspective, because if you don't, you're likely to end up making a transition that's too quick and then feeling uncomfortable, not enjoying the process, and then reverting back to your old habits. And then a few days later, you're just saying nothing changed. 
this whole plant-based diet thing doesn't work for me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And I have a sort of a parallel example. I've always liked to run and do triathlons and so on. So every now and then someone will approach me and say, hey, I want to get ready for I want to do a marathon. You got a 120 day, you know, four month program for a marathon. And I always say, you know what, it might work for you, a four month program. But depending on how much running you've been doing, you, you're going to risk ligaments and tendons and you know, all kinds of things. And it may work. It could be painful. Why don't you take more time? Take three years or something like that and get the body to adjust so that your ligaments and tendons strengthen and all the parts are there. You get a good running stride so you don't wreck your knees and figure out the right shoes and all that stuff. It's just a whole lot better outcome. And the people who've done that, you know, have gone and qualified for Boston and done some really good times. And, but I've seen a lot of people do one marathon 120 days and say, oh, I hurt the whole time. And oh, that was no fun, but I'm glad I did it. It was a bucket list item and that's it. And then they go back to being sedentary. Yeah, that's actually, that's actually a phenomenal analogy. You're right, because there's so many things in life that require time, right? Uh, you know, getting involved in athletics is one of those. There's no question. I mean, you literally the world's best athletes are recreational athletes that want to become even better. You know, if they're trying to lift a little bit more weight or they're trying to become more flexible, they're trying to, uh, you know, improve their running time, you can't expect that you're going to do that over the course of 30 days. It literally can take a year to make significant gains in strength, flexibility, or um, endurance. Similarly, if you're trying to learn, um, you're trying to change your career, right? You can't expect that over the course of the next 30 days, you're gonna absorb everything there is to know about accounting because you're gonna have to put in the time and learn a little bit every single day over the course of a year to two years to three years to eventually have the skill set to be able to transition to your lifestyle or your career to being an accountant. Right? The same thing happens with diet, but yet I think in the world in which we live, one of the things that really becomes problematic is that when you go to the grocery store and you take a look at the magazines which are being marketed to you, it's all about fast results. Okay? You always see these things that say, like, get, get the beach body you deserve in the next 30 days. In 30 Ooh, days, yeah. 25 pounds in the next 30 days. You go to Instagram and you see pictures of people basically showing off their bodies, you know, eating, drinking green smoothies, and it promotes this idea that, like, I have to do this now. The entire world in which we live is all about instant gratification, right? You can order food and it'll be at your door in 15 minutes. You can watch any movie you want from Netflix or Amazon and you can get it in three minutes, right? So we have become programmed to believe that in all aspects of our lifestyle that fast is better and fast is the way to do things. But in reality, when it comes to changing your diet, fast is not the way to do things. You got to do it slowly and you got to do it systematically. And if you do it that way, the chances of you succeeding and developing a whole new collection of habits goes way up, and the chances of you actually transitioning your lifestyle to something that's more sustainable goes way up. You devoted your lives to this. I'd love to hear from each of you, why'd you do that? I mean, you could, like Cyrus, you could be at NASA designing rovers for, for Mars. And Robbie, you have a master's in public health. You could go on and do all kinds of things. You worked for Forks Over Knives for a long time. So why are you doing this? So the reason that I chose to do this the reason that I chose to do this is because... Is that your child? Yeah, my child, yeah. <laughs> I got to go catch her in a second. Um, the reason why I wanted to transition my career from being in aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering to biology and nutritional biochemistry is because it's that important. It is that important. Today's, in today's world, unfortunately, the rates of chronic disease progression are astronomical the rate of diabetes diagnosis is still continuing to increase. For 40 or 50 years now, we have the world's smartest doctors and researchers and scientists working to try and find ways to reduce the rate of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and cancer. And guess what? The rates of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer are all going up. Name one more important problem than that and I may switch to that as well. Um, I, I love what you're saying there, Cyrus. Um, and Chris, for me, it's really just that this is fun. <laughs> I just think everything we're doing uh, with Mastering Diabetes is a heck of a lot of fun. My own you know, personal perspective on life is just nothing makes me happier than the pursuit of health. Like I don't go exercise because I should or I have to. I don't eat well because I should. Um, I, I do these things because I enjoy it. Like it's really, really fun and um, it feels good. Like it's very purposeful. 
and we know that there's a need for what we're doing and um, to see the the joy and the fun that our entire team has at Mastering Diabetes, but in particular our coaches, because our coaches are they're like registered nurses, they're registered dietitians, they're certified diabetes educators, or certified diabetes care and education specialists, that's the new name. They have all these you know, amazing credentials, but in their previous lives, their previous roles, they weren't able to practice what they knew to be the best approach for their patients. They weren't able to guide them towards these changes, and now they get to work with our clients, and they are just so happy. They're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Every Monday we have our team meeting, and each, each coach is sharing their, their favorite win of the week, and just like the smiles and the excitement um, that is on their faces is just really exciting. So um, for us, it's just, I wanna continue doing more and more of it, and I'm really enjoying every, every aspect of the whole operation. As a type one diabetic who has tried both Neil Barnard's diet and Mastering Diabetes diets, I have to say they simply don't work for type one diabetics in most cases to keep completely stable blood sugar. The only one I've seen that actually works to completely control blood sugars that isn't a carnivore diet, which I really dislike, is Bernstein's regimen because it allows a large amount of low carb plants to be eaten with every meal. The other two diets are fine if you want good blood sugars but don't want the rigidity of Bernstein's diet. When it comes to type 2 diabetics, there can be more flexibility with regards to diet because they have a better control in general, at least when the disease is new. So I'm actually really glad to be talking about this particular type of comment because uh, it's, it can be quite confusing to understand how it's even possible to begin to increase your carbohydrate intake, especially to the level that we suggest, which is eating greater than 200, 300, sometimes upwards of 500 or plus grams of carbohydrate per day while still maintaining great blood glucose control. And a lot of people have the experience of uh, trying to eat more carbohydrate and then finding that their blood glucose goes high in the postprandial state, which is after eating a meal. And then they get frustrated and they say, you know what, you're, I tried your approach and it doesn't work. So I wanna just sort of clarify a couple of things here when it comes to blood glucose control because especially in the world of type 1 diabetes when you're injecting insulin, there's many variables to take into account. And blood glucose is one of them that's important, but uh, there's many other variables which you also have to pay attention to. So the first question that I wanna ask is, what, in, in a non-diabetic individual, what would be the ideal, or what is considered an, an acceptable range of blood glucose variation? And the reason why I wanna ask this question is because there's many CGM companies that are new companies that have been around for a couple of years that are advertising their products to non-diabetic individuals and um, making claims like if your blood glucose goes higher than 120 milligrams per deciliter at any moment, then that's considered a quote unquote blood glucose spike and that's dangerous and that's gonna to lead to worse long-term outcomes. And I think a lot of people in the world of type one diabetes also adhere to this information and they start to believe that if their blood glucose goes anything greater than 120, that uh, they're setting themselves up for long-term disastrous consequences. So uh, let me share some research about this topic because it's very important to understand. So there's a couple of papers I wanna draw your attention to. Uh, and these papers talk about what is a uh, glycemic profile in non-diabetic individuals. This paper was published in 2010 these researchers tried to determine what is a, a real blood glucose profile of those who are considered non-diabetic. And what they found was that, first thing, the cutoff for what is considered normal blood glucose variation versus impaired glucose tolerance does not happen at 120. That threshold is 140 milligrams per deciliter. So you can see right here, it says, we found that nearly all individuals without diabetes exceeded the impaired glucose tolerance threshold of 7.8 millimolar or 140 milligrams per deciliter at some point during the day and spent a median of 26 minutes per day above this level. So that's the cutoff. So right there, let's just, uh, recognize that that metric was not invented by them. This is a metric that has been known in the world of diabetes for a very long time, that any number greater than 140 is considered impaired glucose tolerance, and a blood glucose value between 70 and 140 is considered a normal non-diabetic blood glucose variation. 
Secondly, what they found was that glucose levels in persons with diabetes frequently reach this IGT range, meaning above 140, and that a considerable proportion reach diabetic levels on a normal daily basis. And you can actually see in a different paper the variation that some researchers have uh, discovered by putting continuous glucose monitors on non-diabetic individuals. So you see here in the evening hours, blood glucose is actually quite well controlled and nice and flat. But then starting at about eight o'clock in the morning and going all the way through midnight, you see these variations in blood glucose. And sometimes the variations can go greater than 140, greater than 150, and sometimes they can go as high as 180 to 200. Is that first one breakfast? Yeah, this is most likely breakfast right here in the beginning uh, of the day, about 8 o'clock a.m. Orange juice, bowl of oatmeal. Yep. What's, what's important to understand here is that this non-diabetic blood glucose variation um, of 70 to 120, which many uh, companies are now claiming is the only way to keep your blood glucose controlled, is actually too tight of a window. And that the window is likely needed to be expanded to between 70 and 140 in order to actually classify what is considered normal physiological variance in your blood glucose uh, profile. The question is, if I have a bowl of oatmeal and my blood sugar goes up to 140, is that a less healthy meal than if I ate something else, uh, like tofu scrambled and my blood sugar only went up to 100? It depends on your overall macronutrient profile. So I'm actually glad you asked this question because that was the next thing I was going to go into which is that paying attention to your blood glucose is certainly important. There's no question about that. But paying attention to only your blood glucose value and using that as a surrogate marker of your overall health is a slightly dangerous game that allows you to miss many other markers of your basal metabolism that are very important. So I mentioned earlier that having a blood glucose meter is very helpful for people living with type 1 diabetes because it's a way for you to be able to determine whether or not the decisions that you're making right now are benefiting you or harming you over the course of the next two to six hours. And so it's kind of this, uh, this device which is constantly giving you feedback and that feedback you can use to then modify your decision making process, right? But What's important to understand is that uh, you're, this is only telling me my blood glucose. This tells me nothing about how much insulin I'm giving myself. It tells me nothing about my cholesterol levels. It tells me nothing about my blood pressure. It tells me nothing about my C-reactive protein levels. And so it's, it's an incomplete indicator of my overall health. It's just one piece of information that I can use to determine whether or not my decision-making process is moving in the right direction or not, okay? So, um, in order to keep your blood glucose in a very tightly controlled window of what Dr. Bernstein recommends and what many people in the carnivore and ketogenic world recommend is even smaller than 70 to 120. They recommend keeping your blood glucose between 80 and 90 or between 80 and 100. I'm talking about a very, very tight window of blood glucose variation on a daily basis. The question is, is that even necessary? And according to non-diabetic individuals, what you'll find is that that's not necessary because there is a range of blood glucose variation that is considered 100% normal that, is, uh, that happens in healthy individuals. So compressing that window to an even smaller range can become very problematic. The only real way that you can get there is to eat the way that they recommend, is to eat a low carbohydrate diet because anytime you introduce carbohydrates into your mouth in a significant quantity, you're likely to increase the variability by a little bit, okay? <clears throat> I'm not saying that by eating carbohydrate, your blood glucose has to go beyond 140, but when you introduce carbohydrate, there's gonna be a little bit more variability than when you're eating a very low uh, carbohydrate diet. So <clears throat> it's important to understand that by eating a carnivorous diet or a very low carbohydrate diet, then you actually can suppress your blood glucose values and you can keep them controlled within a very, very, very tight window, just like these, uh, these, these experts recommend. Now for a person living with type one diabetes specifically, that can be very challenging to try and accomplish because it's a very narrow window. And uh, um, what the American Diabetes Association recommends is that a, an acceptable window of blood glucose variation for a person with type one is between 70 and 180. And the reason for that is because when you're injecting your own insulin, you can introduce human error into the process. And human error has to be taken into account, especially because when you inject insulin, you can become hypoglycemic, which become life-threatening. So as a result of that, 
the, the window of acceptable blood glucose has to increase to accommodate for human error in the insulin injection process. So according to the American Diabetes Association, 70 to 180 is what's considered a quote unquote normal blood glucose variation. But I realize that there's people living with type one diabetes in particular who, who are like, wow, that's, that's too large of a window. I wanna be more tightly controlled. And so the question really becomes, is it possible to eat the way that we recommend, which is by eating a diet that is low in fat, truly low in fat, less than 30 grams of fat per day, and still compress your blood glucose range to within 70 to 140. And if the answer is yes, then great. Eating the way that we recommend is a doable process and something that's gonna to lead to long-term improvements in your overall health. But if the answer is no, Cyrus and Robbie are making things up, or no, maybe it works in them, but it doesn't work in other individuals, then that's cause for concern. We've run thousands of people through our coaching program and we've observed a lot of their blood glucose values over the course of time. And we have seen over and over, both in those who inject insulin and those who don't inject insulin, that when you migrate towards a low fat diet, less than 30 grams of total fat per day, then you increase your carbohydrate tolerance, which dramatically improves your blood glucose control. So by allowing your muscles and liver the opportunity to uh, absorb and uptake larger amounts of glucose on a meal by meal basis, that right there enables you to eat larger quantities of carbohydrate. And by eating larger quantities of carbohydrate, uh, you can still keep your blood glucose very tightly controlled and achieve a time and range greater than 80%. So Robbie's a perfect example. His time and range often is greater than 95%, and it's very remarkable to see how well controlled his blood glucose is. My, my time and range is a little bit less than his. I usually vary from somewhere between 85% to 95%, depending on a number of factors. I'm also not on a continuous glucose monitor. And as a result of that, both of us have greater than 80% time and range, which is actually a really good thing. And again, we've seen many people go through our program with very similar results. Now, the one thing that I will tell people is that uh, there's many people who say, oh, okay, I did that low fat diet. I tried it and it didn't work. But when you go backwards in time and try and play detective to figure out what actually happened, many people say, okay, I, I tried your diet. I tried it for two weeks. I tried it for three weeks and I found that my blood glucose went high and I got scared. So I, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for me and I don't think it works in general. But it's important to understand that, that optimal blood glucose control takes time, especially if you're injecting insulin because there are so many variables to take into account. The variables to take into account not only are what are you putting into your mouth, what is the carbohydrate and fat and protein content of those foods, but the time when you inject insulin, your insulin timing, okay? Uh, your carbohydrate to insulin ratio at every single meal is gonna be slightly different. How much basal insulin are you giving yourself and at what time are you giving it to yourself and via what method are you giving it to yourself? Um, what is, the, what is the location of your insulin uh, injections? Um, are you using a pump? Are you not using a pump? All of these things matter. And so you can't expect any person who's injecting insulin and trying to change their food at the same time to be able to figure out all of this within a two week period. It's just not possible. And that's why we strongly recommend that people who do make a transition with their diet, whether it's towards the Mastering Diabetes Program or whether it's towards a different regimen, is to take things very slowly because small changes can lead to big results. And if you're not systematic about the process by which you go from diet A to diet B, you're likely to get overwhelmed, you're likely to get confused, and you're likely to find that your blood glucose starts to vary more than you want. And as a result of that, you'll get frustrated and then you'll leave. Now, from a metabolic perspective, uh, reversing years of tissue dysfunction that has accumulated over the course of time from eating a low carbohydrate diet takes a long time to reverse. So we are, we, we've said this a thousand times and I'll say it again, which is that when you eat a low carbohydrate diet, you are actually uh, dramatically increasing the total quantity of fat in your diet, especially if it comes from animal-based foods. And that can increase the accumulation of fat inside of your liver and inside of your muscle. So the triglyceride deposits inside of your liver increase. The triglyceride deposits inside of your muscle increase. And there's plenty of evidence-based research in humans that demonstrates that when you increase the fat content of your liver and increase the fat content of your muscle, you directly impact insulin action.
So the more fat that those two tissues store, the lower insulin action uh, occurs. And by having less insulin action, that means that glucose has a difficult time getting inside of those two tissues, and therefore glucose ends up remaining trapped inside of your blood. So de facto, people who eat a low carbohydrate diet eat more uh, triglyceride, they end up with more triglyceride inside of their liver and inside of their muscle, and as a result of that, their uh, blood glucose often goes higher. It may not happen in the short term, but it definitely happens over the course of time because they're developing more insulin resistance. And so this is reversing that process and getting to a point where your liver can oxidize many of the stored triglycerides that it has accumulated over the course of many months to years takes time. The same thing happens inside of your muscle. Rever oxidizing those stored triglycerides inside of your muscle tissue takes time. So again, anytime people say, you know, I tried your diet for 14 days and it doesn't really work, uh, my suggestion is, okay, we're gonna have to slow things down. We're gonna have to change fewer variables and have those variables change at a slower rate. And as a result of that, you're able to determine whether or not your blood glucose control is actually improving. And I have a strong suspicion that it will. Okay, Chris, I just wanna add, so you, I appreciate this comment. The person who wrote the comment was very thorough and uh, I respect the research they've done and the diligence. And so I just wanna say like, we, we wrote about this in detail in chapter seven of our book, comparing a ketogenic diet to a low fat plant-based whole food diet. And I just wanna be clear, we certainly acknowledge the truth that when you follow a truly low carbohydrate diet, you follow Bernstein's diet, a lot of the people following that, Bernstein himself, they show Excellent blood glucose control, um, insane time and range. We're talking like 99%, 100% consistently. Very, very little blood glucose fluctuation. Like this is all facts. The question really becomes, okay, if you follow the low-fat plant-based whole food diet, the, you're going to have more blood glucose variation, but is that healthy? Is that normal? Is that okay? And Cyrus just covered that research. And so... Yeah, it's our position that yes, as people living with type 1 diabetes, that range of 70 to 180 for type 1 diabetes is perfectly acceptable. And you're welcome to nudge it down if you want to be more disciplined. And you absolutely can do that. So I like to make the distinction between what is biologically happening and what's biologically possible versus what's just challenging for humans to execute. So the fact that you can biologically follow a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, living with type 1 diabetes, and inject a physiologically normal amount of insulin and have you know, steady blood glucose is a, a, a fact that basically anybody can experience if they apply it. But then it's the nuanced details and the discipline of just being a human being that is going to allow you to do that consistently. So there are many, many key variables for people living with type 1 diabetes that you have to master to truly keep it steady on an ongoing basis. Cyrus covered many of them, and the most important ones are for type one is insulin timing. Okay, so you have to make sure the insulin is working before you start eating carbohydrate-rich foods. And people are not taught this, they don't understand that at certain times of day, it takes longer for the insulin to begin working. Um, at certain times of day, it's, it's, actually, it's much shorter. Um, you also have different types of insulin that people are working using. Some people are, are using a long-acting insulin that's not actually working for 24 hours. That causes a lot of confusion for people. Your activity is going to be important, but also how fast you eat is going to be very important for that blood glucose elevation. And what are you eating with your higher carbohydrate foods? Are you including greens? Are you including non-starchy vegetables? Has your activity been consistent? You know, for females, now we're incorporating the menstrual cycle, how that's impacting your insulin sensitivity. So we can go on and on and on. I mean, you talk about, you know, stress, sleep. There are a lot of variables. And that is why we are so passionate about this and why we created a coaching program. This is why we started Mastering Diabetes. And a lot of these nuances apply to type 2 as well, especially in the beginning. They certainly apply to insulin-dependent type 2, type 1.5, people who got diagnosed with gestational diabetes and have been prescribed insulin. Like there's just a ton of nuances in the application of this science. But I will stand by this until one human being shows me that I'm incorrect. I will stand by this. I have yet to see somebody come to us using insulin, because this is the most factual thing that nobody can argue with. Like you are using insulin, you're counting your carbohydrate intake. 
And as you begin to lower that fat intake and eat whole carbohydrates, you will see objectively, factually, you cannot argue that insulin works more efficiently. You need less insulin to metabolize more and more carbohydrate. I have yet to see an exception in our coaching program, at our retreats. I have never had somebody DM us on Instagram and say, look, I did exactly what you said. I followed the meal plan in the book and I didn't become more insulin sensitive. I've never seen that comment. So this comment is explicitly talking about blood glucose control. And that for type one really comes down to your understanding of the details of the nuances. And if you really truly, like I wear a Dexcom G6, I've, I, I've been playing this game for a long time. I know for a fact, if you are very disciplined, you follow the system and you wanna stay between 70 and 140, you could do that. The number one variable that's gonna change that for somebody is how fast you eat. If you eat slow and something went wrong with your insulin timing or you weren't as active and it's rising too quickly, all you'd have to do is pause for 15, 20 minutes, eat the rest of the meal and you could control it all day long. Of course, you have to do all the basics right, but it's within your control. And that's a message I just want everybody to know and it's possible and you can do it. Nobody here ever said it was easy, but it's worth it. So what about the size of meals and timing of meals? Like, you know, if you eat three meals, for me, if I eat three meals a day, I tend to eat bigger meals, um, a big bowl of oatmeal for breakfast with fruit. Uh, whereas if I can snack, which I think I saw you guys doing with bananas, um, in between meals, you, you tend to eat a little less. Does that matter? Does it make a difference? Well, I mean, it, it's like, well, you're, it's a very nuanced question again, because the size of the meal um, it's going to depend on how much carbohydrate-rich food are we talking about. Sometimes the size of the meal could be large because you're eating, you know, a lot of greens, um, a lot of non-starchy vegetables. But if you're more active, that's going to require more carbohydrate content. And because you're more active, you're going to become more insulin sensitive. So it kind of balances itself out. But yes, depending on how insulin resistant somebody is coming into the program, um, splitting meals in half to, you know, to flatten out your blood glucose curve and get the calories you need is a strategy that we have found to be effective. I want to talk about insulin and the hype, living in a hyperinsulinemic state because uh, this is a confusing subject and um, people get it confused all the time. Often in the world of low carbohydrate diets, uh, people become pretty fixated on controlling their blood glucose uh, within a very small window. And while I would say that's a good thing in general, um, paying attention to only your blood glucose, again, misses a whole collection of other variables that are very important for your overall metabolic health. Another one of those variables that is very important is the amount of insulin in your blood over a 24 hour period, okay? So what I mean by that is that in order to really truly understand uh, whether you are, the, the things that you do on a daily basis and the food that you put into your mouth is actually gonna help you in the long term and actually improve and optimize your overall metabolic health, you have to pay attention to just more than your glucose. Your glucose is important, but your glucose and your insulin levels uh, compared one uh, against each other is more important. And so that's why this concept of insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance, that's where it comes in. So. Uh, if you go to a laboratory and try and get your level of insulin resistance measured, uh, there's many different uh, tests that, that you can get put through. Some of these tests are incredibly expensive. They take multiple hours to conduct and they take weeks to analyze. And some of them are much quicker. So like a euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp, as an example, is a, is a test that they use in the research that is very uh, laborsome and very costly to, uh, to administer. But then an oral glucose tolerance test, as an example, is something that you can do in a two to three hour window, and it doesn't require any sophisticated machinery or laboratory technicians. And you're gonna get slightly different results from taking either one of those two tests, but those are both considered to be some of the gold standards in the world of measuring insulin resistance. Now, what I would love to be able to do is, is invent some type of device where I could take this device and I could just like place it on top of you, or I could scan you, and that would tell me your level of insulin sensitivity at any moment in time. Kind of similar to a CGM, right? Where you could just kind of get a small blood sample, you could analyze that, and then that right there would tell you not just your glucose, but a combination of your glucose and insulin and give you a readout that actually has physiological significance. But we don't have that device. And so in order to really understand how to 
calculate insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance for your average individual who's just eating food and or maybe injecting insulin on a daily basis, we have to think about it differently in order to really get to the root of the matter, okay? So um, when you're eating a very low carbohydrate diet, okay, um, most individuals don't recognize that, that doing that enables them to control their blood glucose within a small window, which is actually a good thing. And by doing so, their glucose becomes more controlled, their fasting glucose gets down, their, their post-meal blood glucose comes down, and their time in range goes up. And that's all very good stuff, okay? But there's this thing called your physiological normal insulin resistance amount. Okay? So your physiologically normal insulin, I'm sorry, your physiologically normal insulin amount is the amount of insulin that your pancreas would secrete if you were not living with diabetes uh, in order to metabolize the glucose in your food effectively. Okay? So let's say you're a healthy individual and you're normal weight and you were to do a measurement to try and figure out how much insulin you actually are secreting and that insulin is controlling your blood glucose very well. Like Chris, you're a perfect example of this because you're non-diabetic, you're an active individual, and you're normal weight. So as far as we know, you are quote unquote healthy. So if we were to do this measurement in you and try and figure out how much insulin your pancreas is secreting on a daily basis, we might come up with a number of, let's say 30 units per day. So 30 units per day is what your pancreas is, is secreting in order to keep your blood glucose very well controlled. Now, uh, if, you changed the way that you ate and you started eating a low carbohydrate diet. Your time and range could still be very well controlled, greater than 80%. And you could be, you know, you could be having very good low blood glucose variation. But if we then went and remeasured how much insulin your pancreas was manufacturing and we found out that it is now 45 units per day, we might have a problem. Because effectively what your pancreas is now doing is it's secreting a little bit more insulin in order to control your blood glucose. And as a result of that, now you're forcing your pancreas to work just a little bit harder, okay? So if you measured only your blood glucose, you wouldn't see any difference. You would see good blood glucose control before, good blood glucose control after, and you might come to the conclusion that everything's fine. But if you look under the hood, you find out that your total insulin daily dose went from 30 units per day to 45 units per day, which is a 50% increase simply because you, started, you, you changed the things that you're doing on a daily basis. Okay, so people who eat a low carbohydrate diet often find that in the short term, they get better blood glucose control, which again is a good thing, and they get lower insulin use, meaning if you're injecting insulin, your insulin use comes down, and that's a good thing. So the two of those combinate in, in combination with each other say, okay, great, you're, you have better blood glucose control and you're injecting less insulin, therefore life is good. But over the course of time, things change. Over the course of time, blood glucose becomes harder to control and variability goes up. And then over the course of time, often insulin requirements also tend to go up. And so again, if you put the two of these together and you calculate what is your, you know, your at-home insulin resistance measurement, which is effectively your 24-hour carbohydrate intake, the, the sum total of all the carbohydrate that you're putting into your mouth, and you divide that by the sum total of all the insulin that you might be injecting on a daily basis, you're gonna get some number, right? And if the total amount of carbohydrate that you're eating is low, but your insulin use is increasing over the course of time, then that means that you're, that value is going down and therefore you are becoming more insulin resistant. So this is very classic in the world of low carbohydrate diets and in the world of ketogenic diets. Again, this happens over time. It does not happen initially. And that's why initially people get uh, they get excited and they, they believe that eating a ketogenic diet is a good long-term solution when in reality it is in the short term, but it can be problematic in the long term. So if you, if you try and ask a simple question of like, well, what happens to people over the course of time, right? What happens to people who eat, you know, more uh, animal products over the course of time, lower carbohydrate diets over the course of time, more fat, more protein, is their health actually improved or is their health uh, worsened? And there's actually a number of different studies uh, that touch on this exact topic to try and calculate the, what's called the all-cause mortality risk of individuals who eat a diet that's lower in carbohydrate. So there is some very compelling long-term epidemiological research which demonstrates <clears throat> that 
uh, people who eat a lower carbohydrate diet are generally at a significantly increased risk for all-cause mortality. So here in this first study, this study is analyzing more than 43,000 Swedish women over the course of about 15.7 years. And they stratify people into low carbohydrate, medium carbohydrate, and higher carbohydrate intake. And what they find is actually fascinating, which is that a one-tenth decrease in carbohydrate intake or an increase in protein intake or an increase in the low carbohydrate protein score, effectively meaning the lower their carbohydrate goes, all st statistically significantly increased the incidence of cardiovascular diseases and a 20 gram decrease in daily carbohydrate intake and a five gram increase in daily protein intake corresponds to a 5% increase in the overall risk for cardiovascular disease. Another study demonstrated that uh, in more than 22,000 uh, Greek adults, that they came to a similar conclusion. An increase in protein intake by about 15 grams per day and a decrease of carbohydrate intake by about 50 grams per day is associated with a 22% increase in overall mortality. There's a whole collection of these large-scale epidemiological research studies, and every single one of them published to date, 100% of them published to date, demonstrate the exact same conclusion which is that the lower your carbohydrate value, the higher your risk for all-cause mortality and mortality from cancer, from diabetes, and from heart disease. Whether you're looking at studies that, that analyze 85,000 women, 22,000 men, doesn't matter which country they come from, every single time these epidemiological studies come to a very similar conclusion, which is that the reduction of meat increases longevity. The reduction of animal products increases longevity. And the inclusion of more fat and more protein and more animal products decreases longevity. And some very powerful meta-analyses that have sort of sum totaled all of this research has also found the exact same thing. That the risk of all-cause mortality uh, in those who are eating the lowest carbohydrate diets is actually the worst. So the lower your carbohydrate value, the, uh, the higher your risk for all-cause mortality. And this is not definitive research by any stretch of the imagination, but if you, com if you combine this research with the research that we've seen in small-scale studies, in metabolic ward studies, in randomized control trials, in meta-analyses of randomized control trials, in smaller populations, and then also uh, the research which is shown in larger populations, it all points in the same direction. And that direction is that the lower the carbohydrate value of your diet, the more problems are likely to unfold from a metabolic perspective into the future, which is why, again, we say over and over and over again that our goal is to try and get you to control your blood glucose very well. But we want you to control your blood glucose wearing both short-term goggles and long-term goggles. Your short-term goggles show you what happens in the few hours following a meal, but your long-term goggles show you what happens 20, 30, and 50 years into the future. And if you pay attention to both of those and you have both pairs of goggles on and you're constantly flipping between the two of them over and over and over again, you're likely to recognize that eating a more plant-strong diet or a plant-rich diet is going to lead you to the best short-term and long-term outcomes simultaneously. So uh, Walter Willett says potatoes are fine for people who are metabolically healthy, but not so good when they're one of those foods when you're not metabolically healthy anymore, you shouldn't eat. What do you say about that? So we would say the same thing that we say to, uh, I would actually extrapolate on Walter Willett's uh, statement here. And I would say foods that are carbohydrate rich, and that includes fruits and starchy vegetables and legumes and whole grains, all four of them are problematic if and only if you are living in an insulin resistant state. When you are living in an insulin resistant state, you, you include those foods on top of your baseline insulin resistance, your blood glucose becomes hard to control it's likely that your cholesterol level may go up over the course of time. It's likely that you may gain weight and you may also feel ill, okay? But that's why it's very important for uh, individuals to reverse the underlying disease mechanism that caused insulin resistance and caused 
the metabolic syndrome, if you will, over the course of time. When you start to reverse those processes and regain insulin sensitivity in your liver and regain insulin sensitivity in your muscle and lower your blood pressure and lower your cholesterol value and regain carbohydrate tolerance, then you are earning the ability to eat more carbohydrate-rich foods, including potatoes, like Walter Willett says. And then in that state, when you've reversed or you are in the process of reversing years worth of metabolic damage, then you can start to include these carbohydrate-rich foods. And not only will your blood glucose be well-controlled, but they will also help control your blood glucose and actually lower your blood glucose, lower your body weight, lower your cholesterol, and lower your blood pressure at the same time. What about that paper that Walter Willett co-authored from Harvard, the Nurses' Health Study that says just a tablespoon, a little less than a tablespoon of olive oil a day reduces your mortality by greater than 90, greater than 10 percent. The inclusion of uh, a little bit of oil, which we are, you know, truth be told, not huge fans of, especially for people living with insulin resistance. But if you were to include the oil in substitution for more saturated animal-based fats and or more packaged and processed goods, then I could see how that, would, that could improve many markers of your metabolic health. Um, but just for clarity, we do recommend that people living with any form of diabetes or people who have impaired glucose tolerance, AKA insulin resistance, uh, try, do their best to try and avoid oils because we find over and over again that those who do input oil into their diet find that their blood glucose is harder to control both in the short and the long term. And by eliminating those oils, they can actually get significantly improved blood glucose control, which then lowers their A1C and sets the way for them to dramatically improve their cholesterol value, their triglyceride value, and their blood pressure at the same time. Chris, I, I just, I really want to tell you about Tammy. Tammy is one of my favorite testimonials who's been through our coaching program. And her story is very important because she had fasting insulin data before joining our program. We all don't feel well before we ever go and find out that we're not well. Can you talk a little bit about what your status was? It seemed like you had all kinds of risk factors, two Alzheimer's genes and weight and cholesterol and blood right. pressure. It just seems like you had the whole, you got the bonus package. My doctor had said to me, can I genetically test you? It turned out that um, everything that I had that came up um, diabetes, high cholesterol, high LDL, high triglycerides, high red blood count, high hematocrit. I mean, I just was like a Christmas tree lit up. It was all bad. And then my genes test came back and I had two genes for Alzheimer's. I had, I'm in the highest risk category for all the metabolic diseases, you know, diabetes, heart disease, all of it. Plus I have two genes. I was listening to Dr. Um, Bernard one day talking about Alzheimer's and there's this other gene that kind of goes along with the APOE3, which is a C677T. And I have two copies of that also. So, so I just, I, I did a little crying for a while there and then I just decided to um, buck it up and um, do something about it. She was just like kicking and screaming. Like, I just don't think it's going to work for me. I was buying, I bought a bunch of oranges and she's like, really, I can eat oranges. I'm like, Tammy, yes. Like just give it a shot. Just, you have nothing to lose. And eventually she did, like she really went all in. She's like, okay, I'm gonna to commit to this. I found my way to mastering diabetes by researching diabetes, insulin resistance, words I'd never heard before. In just seven months, she had her A1C go from 7.1% to 5.3. And we gotta understand that that, that 7.1 A1C is medicated. She was using 2000 milligrams of metformin. So without the metformin, it probably would have been higher. In seven months, she lost 38 pounds. In seven months, her fasting blood glucose went from 123 to 93. In seven months, her fatty liver disease was completely reversed, completely turned around, gone. She also had debilitating pain that prevented her from hiking. I spent most of my adult life popping ibuprofen around the clock like candy. You know, it just, it was an automatic thing where I just, every six to eight hours, I was popping four ibuprofen from over the counter. 
And, um, and I lived in complete pain. My knee was always inflamed. I couldn't do the things I wanted to do with my children. You know, I would sit at the Grand Canyon and I would look over the edge while they walked down into it. And so she has pictures of her the previous year in Mexico, not being able to climb to the top of the pyramids. And then the next year in our Facebook group, she posts a picture of her from at the top being like, wow, look at me. And her whole body's transformed. Eating this way is so anti-inflammatory that, I mean, I have a little bit of pain here and there. It gets cold outside. You're going to feel some pain in your joints, you know, as you get older. But it's nothing that makes me take the ibuprofen regularly. But here's the kicker. Here's the big one. She had her fasting insulin tested. So before adopting the Mastering Diabetes Method, her fasting insulin was 17.4, which is very high. It really, really shouldn't be above 8. So then she begins following our program. She starts eating lots of fruit, plenty of potatoes, rice, beans, a lot of high carbohydrate, whole foods, plenty of greens, plenty of non starchy vegetables. And not only does her A1C drop and her medication becomes not required anymore, no, no more metformin, 5.3 A1C, that's non-diabetic, but her fasting insulin levels dropped to 5.2, right where you want it to be. So that's a perfect example of a human being adopting this approach that you're talking about all the time in your videos, becoming more insulin sensitive. She now has her body producing a healthy, physiologically normal amount of insulin to metabolize whole carbohydrate rich food. And she's maintaining excellent blood glucose control as shown by the A1C over the course of a three month period. Last time you were at the farmer's market, you saw some crazy old man wandering by himself, talking to himself in a camera. And what did you think? I thought, the silhouette of that guy looks just like this YouTuber I watch. Then I didn't say hi, because I was really awkward. I was like, what if it's not? And I'm just like, and I'm the crazy one. What if I'm the crazy one here? And then my friend was like, okay, you can just go up to him and see his face and ask. And I was like, no. But then you like walked around again. Yeah. And then I saw your hoodie and I was like, that's the guy. 